And now I will introduce today's guest. David Frum is a seasoned veteran in a rapidly growing and changing arena. And like all of you, I am anxious to hear how we make sense of it all. News content and editorials of one form or another are everywhere. Of course, I'll never tire of retrieving my morning paper on the way out the door. But what about the 24-hour-a-day news stations that seem to follow us everywhere we go? The gym, the subway platform, the elevator, the food court and the nice folks hanging out, handing out free papers on the street corner, morning and afternoon. Don't they know my Blackberry, iPhone, iPad, Kindle, Kobo, and laptop are ready to explode with RSS feeds, tweets, text alerts, and must-see video sent by people who never forward this kind of stuff. <laughs> Even if we weed out content that few of us would ever refer to as journalism, and even if we limit our discussion to political journalism, the electronic age has opened up the floodgates to a vast sea of opportunities to disseminate and consume content. For news reporters and journalists, the internet has meant instantaneous and worldwide access to events in real time. For the world, the web and all it has spawned, social media, global networking, and instantaneous communication of all kinds, uh, the internet means that virtually anyone who can post a document to a website can be a de facto journalist. For world-renowned political pundits like our guest today, challenge and opportunity really do walk hand in hand when it comes to getting the word out. Born in Canada, David Frum earned degrees from Yale University and Harvard Law School. He wrote for the Wall Street Journal and Forbes, Forbes magazine before becoming a speechwriter and special assistant to former U.S. President George W. Bush. Mr. Frum is the author of six books, two of which have been New York Times bestsellers. He's a commentator on American public media's marketplace and a regular columnist for Time Magazine, CNN.com, The Week, and The National Post. He's also editor of Frum Forum, a content-rich blog tropolis that's dedicated to the modernization and renewal of the Republican Party in the US and the conservative movement in general. On behalf of the Canadian Club of Toronto and the Canadian Journalism Foundation, I'm honored to invite David Frum to the podium. Um, I, thank you, I, I truly thank the Canadian Club uh, for the honor of this invitation, um, that there is uh, to appear on a podium in the city of one's birth um, is an experience quite unlike anything else one can possibly have in life. And I'm so honored that so many good friends would come to hear um, these thoughts today. I have so many thank yous I would like to um, pay. I don't know that I'll be able to say all of them adequately to Beth Haddon, a longtime colleague of, of my mother. Um, thank you for this invitation. I truly appreciate it. Um, I appreciate our sponsors at Metropia. If you are, in the, if you are shopping for a Metropolis, Metropia are the only people to buy it from. <laughs> uh, and um, uh, I want to, and I, I see my uh, father and st stepmother are, are here today, and I thank them um, for coming. You may have seen the uh, newspaper this morning. It had a little mention of some, some trouble um, I am in these days. Um, my wife, during one of our bounds of trouble, my wife tried to uh, cheer, cheer me up by uh, referring to that old saying, the good thing about being in a fight like this is you learn who your friends are. And the thought that occurred to me was, I was happier when I didn't know. <laughs> um, and perhaps that explains. That, that, that there's that other famous saying about Washington that if you need a friend in Washington, get a dog. We have three dogs. <laughs> now, to, to address a room of journalists, about the, uh, with so many journalists, about the state of journalism seems like speaking in Youngstown, Ohio, about the future of steelworking. These have been tough times for the media business. Uh, layoffs at ABC News, Newsweek sold for a dollar, the Chicago Tribune and Los Angeles Times dumped as distressed properties. But why continue? The people here who work in this industry know the worst as well as I. Today, I'd like to step back from that carnage and see if we can discern some deeper trends and if we can find ways to respond to these trends creatively and positively. I think I see five trends at work of special importance. The first trend in political journalism in the news media is a trend to demonopolization. 
Um, I see today my uh, father-in-law, Peter Worthington. Um, Peter, of course, launched the Toronto Sun in 1971. When he did so, that was the first successful launch of a daily newspaper in a major North American market since Marshall Field, heir to an enormous department store fortune, was able to launch the Chicago Sun-Times 30 years before. Um, and it was, of course, if success means profit making, it was the last launch of a da daily newspaper. The USA Today was launched la later, but USA Today has never made any money. Um, it, the barriers to entry into the newspaper business rose very high in the 1970s. Printing presses cost big money, distribution networks were difficult to build, and above all, the most lucrative advertising was concentrated in the papers that dominated the market. Um, if, you, if your paper could get even a slight majority of the marketplace, it would get the overwhelming portion of the most valuable form of advertising, classified advertising, because the sellers and the buyers of houses and cars all want to be in the same place. Broadcast barriers were even more daunting back then. Big networks formed an ultra-profitable oligopoly whose returns on investment would impress the oil companies. All of this has gone, gone, gone. Barriers to entry have collapsed. Craig Newmark killed classified advertising. I was recently in, in St. Louis and uh, was taken to see the premises that had, that had once been occupied by one of the city's papers, the St. Louis Globe Democrat. Uh, they had, because they had gone so broke so, fa so early, they had never had a chance to do a 1970s renovation of their newspaper building. When you walked in, it, it evoked this extraordinary vanished memory for, for me of, of going uh, with my parents when I was a little child uh, to newspapers as they existed long, long ago. They looked like banks. In the foyer, they had these huge, um, they had teller's windows because you would come and you would stand in line and you would take a little pencil and you would write the words of your classified ad for your bicycle or your car or the uh, room to let in the basement and hand them in, and that was what was in the lobby, the people who collected the money for that advertising that, was the, that millimeter per millimeter was the most costly in the paper. Um, and of course, proliferating cable channels have cannibalized the, net, the revenue of, of television networks. And today, the surest way, as I've discovered, to sound like an old fogey in the media business is not to talk about the typewriter, but to tell the youngsters that used to be, exist this thing called an expense account. Following demonopolization comes the second big trend, I see, and that is deprofessionalization. Monopoly revenues to media companies formerly paid salaries that elevated journalism from a trade, which it had been before the Second World War, into a profession. Universities began to offer degrees in journalism. Journalists discussed and debated codes of professional ethics. Uh, I see Robert Fulford here, and he tells a very funny story in his memoirs about how in the, er in the early 1950s, it was a common practice if you were covering a sporting team after you collected your pay in cash to go to the wicket at the, uh, for journalists at the arena where the sporting team was, and there you would receive the little topper, the additional increment to your salary that was paid by the sporting organization, inconceivable by the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, and media companies instituted public editors to respond to perceived bias or unfairness in their extremely powerful enterprises. But as barriers to entry have collapsed, the line between a media professional and an ordinary person has collapsed as well. Who is the media these days? Anybody who wants to be. Um, the, the, uh, Oh, the, uh, the videos and the clips that have destroyed careers, like, for example, that of a man who might well be running for president right now, George Allen, had he won re-election um, to the Senate from Virginia in 2006. That career was destroyed by somebody who happened to be there with a video camera. That person is a powerful, powerful journalist, but, of course, no journalist at all. Conversely, who must not worry, who is not a journalist, who does not have to worry about journalistic ethics? Nobody who does not want to. And here's another case in point. Perhaps you remember John Stewart's famous appearance on Crossfire, where Stewart memorably scolded the host for lowering the tone of public debate. One of the hosts challenged Stewart. Well, what about your tone, he asked. And Stewart answered, you are on CNN. The show that, le that leads into me is puppets making crank phone calls. <laughs> it's a funny line, and it's a convenient excuse. And Stewart is not the only one to use it. It's the excuse used by radio talk show hosts, by the new American polemical cable stations, by bloggers. You see, if we are caught doing something wrong, fabricating, not checking, repeating things that are not thoroughly checked out, we're not really journalists, you see. 
Uh, the rules don't govern us. Those rules are for the CBS Evening News and the New York Times. The fact that more and more Americans and people around the world happen to get their information from people like us, that doesn't make us journalists. You are a journalist if you decide you want to be bound by an ever more burdensome set of seemingly obsolete restraints. Uh, and the result of this is that while a generation ago, in these highly profitable, um, highly exclusive media companies, quality control was self-imposed in these vertically integrated enterprises. There were editors and checkers. Today, the media companies are no longer, like uh, what has happened to manufacturing companies, they're no longer vertically integrated. They now exist in a competitive market, and, the, and quality control has been outsourced to people who uh, check each other off, uh, but not often with the most high-minded of motives, often with, uh, for political purposes of their own. So the quality control comes from outside. Websites mock each other for their mistakes. John Stewart satirizes Fox. The conservative Daily Caller website bought the KeithOlberman.com site to post hostile comments about the MSNBC television star. And this trend toward demonopolization and deprofessionalization leads to a third trend, rising demands on the media consumer. A generation ago, media organizations thought very hard about what their audiences needed to know and what they did not need to know. The headlines on the front page, the order of items in the nightly news, all reflected the, new, the news judgment of some hierarchical organization with different ranks who would, at uh, regular intervals, meet to decide what the public should find out. Now, these same organizations, it should be said, also decided what their audiences did not need to know. And they are very clear that a big part of their um, purpose was to prevent the public from learning things that, in their view, the public should not learn, whether a politician was having an extramarital affair, the race of the mugger, other things that they thought the public was better off not knowing. Uh, today, that system of selection has completely collapsed. Today, there is more information available than ever, but the job of making sense of that information is thrust upon the news user. Walter Cronkite used to sign off his broadcast and that's the way it is. Who would dare say such a thing today? Who would believe him if he did try to say such a thing? It is the way each of us wishes to believe it is. We used each to be entitled to our own opinion, but not our own facts. But with the ever-expanding expan scope of human rights, we are now also entitled to our own facts. Now, this need to work harder and harder, uh, for, by the, uh, this need uh, of the consumer to work harder and harder has led to a fourth trend, a fourth consequence of the prior trend, which is increasing information inequality. As it happens, there was an important election in Venezuela yesterday. If you'd like to know more about it, and if you care, you can be informed on a scale that would have boggled the mind in 1975. No need to wait for the breezy 200-word summary in The Economist. Uh, there is available right now maps. Uh, you can have uh, color coding. Uh, you can see district by district how the vote went. You can watch the reaction of the major political parties. If you'd like to know more, you can visit websites and blog spots that offer commentary in Spanish and English and other languages. Um, you can be extraordinarily immersed in uh, the details and consequences of this global story. And what is true of the election in Venezuela is true of the international financial crisis. It is true um, about the uh, state of things in the shipping industry. It is true for whatever you would like to know about the U.S. budget, social programs. All of that is available to you if you wish to seek it or not. You can also avoid it. A generation ago, it was difficult to be completely ignorant of public events. In order to atta attain complete ignorance, what you would have to do is get off the couch at 6 o'clock, walk over to the television set, and turn it off, and then carefully time things until 6.30, at which point you turned it back on. Um, and if you were that lazy, uh, uh, you probably wouldn't bother. You would pick up a little something. And back then as well, more of us, more of us were associated with formally organized institutions churches, trade unions, service clubs, veterans organizations that pushed information out to members and saw it as their job to inform members in active membership organizations. Today, while the best informed 5% of the population know more about the world around them than any previous information elite in the history of the world, the least informed bottom one-third of the population almost certainly knows much less than their parents did, possibly even than their grandparents did. We can easily measure the gathering economic inequality that looms so large in all the advanced economies, especially, but not only, the United States. Information inequality is harder to measure, 
but it is perhaps more profoundly consequential. And it may indeed be one of the most important causes and incubators of the economic inequality. Because to understand, what, uh, to, to do something about a trend that disfavors you, you have to know that it exists. And if you are uninformed, you do not know. And this, uh, this takes us to the fifth trend, which is the increasing importance of strategic communication and miscommunication. Now, there's long, as long as there's been communication, verbal and nonverbal, there has been propaganda. Um, what, what is the chateau at Versailles, but propaganda? Um, and if you go into Rome and you look at the, uh, beside the, uh, the, the funeral altar of the Emperor Augustus, they are carved in stone along the walls, is his, are his propagandistic statements. This is an ancient thing. There is nothing new about it. But what is new is as the, as the importance of communication, as the centrality of media, as the pervasiveness of media have, have intensified, so true to has the consciousness of how media can be used. Probably everybody here remembers the incident of the Mavi Marmara, the Turkish boat that attempted to force the Israeli blockade of Gaza. The boat organizers hoped to focus international condemnation on Israel. Their plan backfired when Israel released video footage of the knife-armed boat crew savagely attacking Israeli commandos as they repelled into the boat. Now, this incident is a microcosm of modern warfare. It is completely unlike the battles of previous times, unlike the Battle of the Bulge, unlike the great battles of the First World War. In those eight former battles, the purpose of violence was by force to impose will on a defeated enemy. Uh, the, uh, of course, you are alert to propagandistic elements, but the clash of power upon power was the primary purpose of a military encounter. That is no longer true. What you saw on the Mevi Marmara was a play. That it, the purpose was not for the one side to win or for the other side to win. The purpose of each of them was to capture the attention of the world. Violence in modern warfare is not intended to enforce will upon an opponent. War, modern war, is public relations by other means. But it is not only war. It is true in politics and business and culture. Messaging increasingly dominates all other aspects of activity. Look at this season's elections in the United States. Yes, they feature traditional organization and get out the vote measures and other things that, that um, would be somewhat familiar in the politics of the 1960s or 1970s. But all of that is less important than the central activity to which all of the best uh, efforts of both parties are bent, and that is framing a narrative that can explain what is happening to supporters who are increasingly reached not by organizations, but by media of various kinds, formal and informal. The Republicans want to frame a narrative of, de of Democrats as anti-constitutional economic extremists. The de Democrats want to frame a narrative of Republicans as ignorant, incompetent, and primitive. The media collectively are more powerful than ever, but individual media enterprises are much weaker than they used to be. And this gives sophisticated messengers both a greater incentive and a greater ability to shape the mental universe in which we all live. I'd like to add here a personal note. Um, I've had an experience in my own life where I have moved from being somebody who participates in the media world as a writer and speaker, um, as an individual, to someone who's trying to run a, an enterprise, a very small enterprise, but an enterprise. And that is the website that was kindly mentioned uh, in the opening, fromforum.com. Um, I have to say, when I started this thing, I, I was very embarrassed at the thought of naming it after myself, and I was very reluctant. We opened under a different name, but it was quickly, I was quickly made to understand by people who understand these things better than I do, that in the modern universe, uh, everything is a brand, um, and you just have no choice about whether you participate, you play by those rules or not, you play by those rules or you fail. Um, you cannot bring your own rules to the game. Um, my goal was to work to take it to, to appeal to the fact that people do have to work harder um, and to try to find some to pr put out some alternative to the increasing alienation partisanship rancor and misinformation that is incentivized by the way modern media culture works especially in the context of of american politics and i've been very gratified that there has been um, that there has been a very positive response we we get a lot of traffic and we get a lot of attention and that is, that that is very gratifying to see but there is no denying that the overwhelming array of incentives forces things to become worse and worse and worse. Uh, that what people, uh, people benefit even more from or seek even more than they seek information, is they seek validation, um, and, and they seek in society, and they seek validation of their own feelings about people who are different from them. One of the things that television does very powerfully is it can subtract, 
it can enhance its own credibility by subtracting from the credibility of other institutions. It has a kind of parasitic function. Um, summarized by um, a slogan, advertising slogan used by many different local TV stations across the United States, Channel X, Channel Y, we're on your side. The implication is, of course, that all the other forces of society are not on your side. Uh, they are opposed to you and that television can be your champion and advocate. Um, we, uh, we have moved into a situation in which one of the things that one, is one of the most powerful competitive advantages that a television network or entity or a media network or entity can bring is their ability more successfully than their competitors to mobilize people's anger at their fellow citizens, uh, at other people in other parts of the world. Um, and that is a very dangerous uh, trend. Um, we live in very successful societies. Canada these days looks more successful than most. But there is no guarantee that stability and prosperity are some kind of entitlement, and that societies that have been successful must continue to be successful. Success is the product of decisions by everybody in the society, and especially by the society's leaders. And if the incentive structure invites conflict rather than consensus, and invites elites to mobilize populations against one another, rather than recognizing the greater commonalities that all have in a time of crisis, the results can be very dangerous. We all have to be more active citizens, that we know. We also, that implies that we have to be more active news consumers. And we have to resist, resist the dangerous invitation of this extraordinary modern proliferation of media that offers us an opportunity to know more than ever before, but also offers up the opportunity to know more than ever before that is not true. And I thank you for your attention, and if you'd like to ask some questions, I'm delighted to take them. Uh, and there's a microphone that will follow you, so if you, if you raise your hand. Um. Okay, and then this one. Hello, David. Pleasure to have you back to ask questions of. I don't know if you ever expected before you left Canada to find common cause with the Red Tories of Canada, but you probably find yourself like the so-called Red Tories isolated right now. Ultimate insiders like David Crombie and Joe Clark now find themselves um, outside their party, forced to the edges of it, no longer consulted for their opinions, just as I guess you've been forced out of the mainstream Republican Party if you want to consider the Tea Party as having control of it right now. So my question is, and we all know that part of the political game these days is owning the language. If you can define the language and own the language, you won the war before it begins. So to what extent, when you were a speechwriter in the White House, were contributions like the axis of evil I think it was originally, I'm told, the axis of hatred and evil, and WMDs, which contributed, I guess, to the language of government, and have now been kind of co-opted by the Tea Party people and the Rush Limbaugh's. Do you feel any responsibility, I guess, for the simplification of the language, the um, sometimes simpletons who have taken over, I guess, the, the core of the Republican Party, and the people who provide, I guess, the most threat to Republican centrists like yourself in the next election? Well, the, the Tea Party movement is not a movement that is primarily about international affairs. Um, the Tea Party movement in the United States is, uh, I think, driven by this extraordinary economic pressure in today's economic crisis in the United States. Um, and it is an attempt, uh, that the grassroots of it are an attempt to come up with some kind of understanding, some kind of way of um, uh, interpreting to themselves what they have gone through. Your point about language is very powerful, that we are only able to apprehend the world through the vocabulary that we've got. Uh, and one of, the, uh, uh, one of the things that um, is true in the United States is there are certain categories and words that you can use to explain what's happening to you, and the Tea Party movement has offered people a way to understand what is happening to them in a way that makes sense. Why is my house worth less? Why did my savings vanish? Uh, why, uh, why is it so difficult for me to find work if I've been laid off for my children to enter the workforce? Um, why do I, even before the crisis, why did my income not rise um, in, time, in a time of apparent prosperity in the 2000s? And, and uh, the Tea Party movement offers both an explanation and it offers a set of adversaries, of enemies who are, who are to blame. And a lot of the work of politics is, is f focusing uh, people on these kinds of, of um, threats to themselves. The test of political communication is our, uh, there's no escaping simplification 
in political communication. The test is, is your simplification, um, does it correspond more or less to the facts? Uh, and does it help people to make decisions that enhance their welfare, enhance the welfare of their society? Um, when I look back on, on the Bush years, I think President Bush got a lot of things right in his analysis of the kind of organization the Republican Party needed to be. Um, it could not be an, an organization based on the message of economic libertarianism. The country wouldn't accept it. There are too many vested interests, right or wrong, that, they, that accrete around exact, exact existing programs. I think he got that right. What he did not get right was he did not have a solution. He did not have something to put in place. What he had were a series of political, uh, he had a political answer, he didn't have a policy answer. So he recognized that the idea that, that you were going to be able to reduce government even beyond what Reagan and Thatcher had done, that, that was not going to work. What he did not have was an answer as to how do you raise the standard of living uh, for Americans in a time of economic pressure. And the result was that the median income, median household income in 2007 was lower than it had been in 2000. And the kindling built up for this enormous economic conflagration that exploded, that began to burn in the summer 2007 and exploded in the fall of 2008, and to which these days nobody has yet shown a good answer. David, do you have any uh, thoughts, armchair or otherwise, as to how high schools and perhaps even the early years of undergraduate uh, university education might help to, um, you know, better provide that critical awareness that the, the, the media consumer so desperately needs? It's a fascinating but perhaps distressing trend. Or any other thoughts, actually? Um, I, I think we are... Um, uh, I think what I would say, the, the main lesson I take from our education is... Um, that the much derided skills of generalism and the, uh, the, of the liberal arts are going to become more and more important. I think one of the, uh, when, when, you, when you watch um, a television show and they want to introduce a character who's intelligent, uh, one of the ways they always, one of the markers on a TV comedy of somebody's intelligence is they perform a feat of memory. They, recall, they rattle off some string of facts. Um, and it used to be true that that was our proxy for intelligence, but pretty soon, well, it's already true that you can carry every fact in the world right here in your pocket. Um, and uh, pretty soon, you'll be able to carry them all in video form. Um, and the, the ability to recall things will become less and less important because your hard drive will become increasingly external to yourself. Um, and that your, your tests will be, of your ability, will be your uh, ability to manipulate and recall things from your, this hard drive you're going to carry in your pocket of all the facts in the world. Um, and people need to know not what do they, what, not recollection, but how can they organize, how can they, uh, how can they make priorities? And one of the things that is really remarkable, for example, one of the successful shows on Fox is, is Glenn Beck's show. One of the things that Glenn Beck does every night is he talks about history. And it's an amazing thing that you would have a popular show in which somebody talks about history. And it ought to be a welcome thing, especially since the facts are typically more or less correct. But the perspective is so skewed, so, wrong, so in a funhouse mirror, that uh, you actually would have to that you would have to know much more than merely the facts, the historical dates, and the names to understand why what you're being told is not only wrong but um, dangerously deceptive and, and misleading. Um, those kinds of, of tools are going to become more and more important. How to understand the truth? What builds an argument? What counts as persuasion? Uh, what kind of uh, what kinds of facts are those that are conclusive? Those are things that people are going to need to know. I think we have time for one more short question, and then we wrap up. Well, David, I, is it on? Is it on? Yeah. I really appreciated your remarks because I've been on, I've been on a soap opera about this. Um, soapbox, that is. It's soap opera at times. Mostly a soapbox about this issue about um, the proliferation of journalists we have and the fact that there are so many people who are acting like journalists without the professional standard. And I think that we have to do something to have people be more accountable for the remarks that they make. People's lives are being destroyed by facts out there that aren't correct. Our professional journalism takes some accountability for it in their retraction notices, not always as big as they should be in my view, but um, so many others don't. Is there a um, legislative solution to this? And I ask this not just as a lawyer looking for business, but is there? Um, some kind of law that we need to look at to um, have people be more accountable for the statements that they make and distribute publicly. Um, 
if, if there is, it's beyond my imagination to imagine what it might be. But I understand your point. Let me give you a concrete example. Um, yesterday, the Drudge Report led with a story of, um, that somebody on a website had information alleging that John Boehner, um, the likely next Speaker of the House, had had an extramarital affair with a Washington lobbyist. If true, this would be quite an embarrassing story. Uh, but it seems like the person just completely made it up. Um, and in fact had a history of, of, of doing these things. He put it on his website and then he, he got other people to link to the website because it was titillating and now we have a controversy. And so people whose standards would never allow them to report this completely unsourced, undocumented fact as a fact can report on the controversy about the fact. Um, and, uh, and then we are all left with a vague impression that there must be something because there is no such thing as smoke without fire. It's like that old joke about the police arresting the people at the demonstration in Union Square. There are two counter demonstrations and the police are hauling people into the wagons to take them away. And somebody says, no, you don't understand. I'm an anti-communist. And the policeman says to him, I don't care what kind of communist you are, you're going downtown. Uh, okay. So that, I don't think it's any, But how do, what do you do about this without an extraordinary um, violation of people's rights? Uh, I mean, we have the libel laws, but most of the people who do this are going to be judgment proof anyway. Um, I think this is just our world. Um, and it is going to look a lot more like the media world of 200 years ago than it looks like the media world of 30 years ago. It's going to be more uh, open. It's going to be more participatory. Uh, it is going to be more scurrilous. It is going to be more nakedly partisan. It is going to be more bought and paid for by powerful outside forces rather than by hierarchical organizations. Um, it is going to be uh, much more of it will be done by people with a deliberate agenda for commercial or political reasons to mislead others. Um, and we are all going to have to be um, much more uh, much better consumers. It is going to be much more like buying milk in a Chinese open air market than it is going to be like buying milk at an old fashioned Safeway. And I thank you. Uh, And I'd now like to welcome Don Newman to our stage. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Nick. Uh, you know, uh, I think all of us coming here today thought that uh, David Frum's remarks would be both uh, provoking, uh, thought provoking, and informative, and we haven't been disappointed, have we? He's certainly been both, and uh, he certainly. Uh, we were right because he was so good. I have to tell you though, David, that your uh, description and prognosis of what is playing out in the United States uh, is worrisome and even a bit frightening. And uh, here in Canada, of course, a lot of it we're seeing or beginning to see already. As you point out, the situation is basically technology driven by the internet and by cable news channels. Not that I would ever say anything about cable news channels. But uh, the fact is that both, but particularly the internet, have greatly expanded the number of voices in any debate, though sadly that has not improved either the quality of the information or the clarity of thought. Your point is right. Everyone is entitled to their own opinion. No one is entitled to their own facts. And as you pointed out as well, sadly today many bloggers and invited commentators on television respond to their own facts, or lacking any real facts, they just make them up. But luckily, there remain people who do apply their own reason and judgment to real facts before committing their thoughts to print, the internet, or the airwaves. And David, you are one of them. Thank you for that, and thank you for sharing your thoughts and insights with us today. Thank you very much, Don. Thank you, David. Uh, thanks again to our sponsor, Metropia, for making this event possible. Uh, also, our media sponsor, The National Post. Uh, thank you again to the Canadian Journalism Foundation for partnering with us. Uh, this brings to a close our uh, live broadcast on Rogers Television. Uh, we'd like to thank Rogers and uh, 680 News for their ongoing coverage of Canadian Club luncheons. And ladies and gentlemen, this meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>